Hey, Lee with LG Speed and Custom here, and in this video, we're back on my 32 sedan. In the last video, we had took the frame off the rotisserie after painted it, put the front suspension in, put the rear suspension in, and drop the engine and transmission in. So for now, we're just gonna continue putting it together. Shannon and I have been coming into the shop every night after dinner and spending like an hour, hour and a half on it every single night. And we've gotten quite a bit of stuff done. Let me show you what we've been up to. We've got the drive shaft in now. That was pretty straightforward and easy to do. Shannon has been working on the spark plug wires. She put a new distributor cap on and made all these plug wires. These are Raja ends, which are really cool ends. I really like those a lot. She's been experimenting with cable lacing. So this is just some string that we had laying around. She wanted to practice and see if she could do it. And naturally she got it first try. So we're gonna get some uh, black waxed cord. I forget what it's called, waxed linen cord. We're gonna get some of that and she's going to redo this again in black now that she knows that it works and she likes it. The emergency brake handle is Shannon polished it all and then painted the end. So that can go back in now. The emergency brake cables are, you know, I've never taken the emergency brake cables apart as long as they've been on the car. That is the one thing that did work. I don't know if you guys remember when we drove this car from Make It Custom in Maple Ridge back to Victoria, but all I had for brakes was the emergency brake, that's the only thing that worked. So once we get it installed, we can probably trim these. They don't need to be that long. Speaking of brakes, that's what I've been working on in the evenings. This is the original 32 Ford pedal assembly, which is still in great shape. So I just wire wheeled it, put it back in. Once I get everything working properly on it, we can blow it back apart and paint it. But the master cylinder, this car had a dual reservoir master cylinder from like a 67 Mustang. And it was mounted like that. The only problem with it mounted like that is the lid did not, you couldn't get this little spring clip to hold the lid on. So that's why I had no brakes is because the lid had come off and all the brake fluid had come out. So I made a new bracket. Here's what it had. For a bracket, this just bolted to the bottom of the K-member, kind of like so. And then the master cylinder bolted on the end here. So it, it almost worked. If this was three quarters of an inch further back, that would have been fine. So I made a new one that is three quarters of an inch further back. Basically the same concept as that one, just done a little bit fancier. And the master cylinder will bolt on there. This bolts to the K-member in the, the factory pedal assembly holes. And it does the same thing as this one, just with the master cylinder moved a little bit further back so that the lid fits properly. With this being paint or uh, test fit now, we can go ahead and paint this and probably bolt it on for good. We're gonna have to make a new push rod that is three quarters of an inch longer, obviously. And then we can put the master cylinder on and it's ready to start doing brake lines. Another thing I want to tackle is we've got this clutch linkage set up. This was, I'm assuming, probably built the same time this was because it's the same kind of C-channel material. And while it worked and was totally functional, I think we can make one that is just a little bit less bulky. So we're gonna tackle that. Same with this uh, clutch linkage rod. I think we can make something that's a little bit less bulky than that. This stuff all worked. It's just, you know, this is old time hot rod stuff. This is when people are all talking about survivor hot rods and like 50 style hot rods. You know, this is how some of them were built. You build it with what you have. This person obviously didn't have a hole saw, but they had a grinder. They made it work. As much as people like to talk down about people that do this kind of work on the internet. 
the person that can build this and mount a master cylinder or build a clutch linkage using stuff they have laying around, those are the people who, when you break down on the side of the highway, they're gonna help you get home. They can find random parts in the ditch and get your car back on the road again. So now that you guys are all up to date on everything, let's blow some paint on this thing and then while it's drying, we can putter away at some of the other stuff on here. I'm gonna use this old clutch bracket assembly as kind of a template. I've repositioned, this used to sit over here and I've moved it over here and that just lines all this stuff up a little bit better. It was kind of on an angle before and now it's straight. So I've traced that on here. I've traced where our K-member dog legs sit so now we can unbolt this and use it as a, as a template to draw a new one up on and cut it out. I'm not gonna use this mechanical brake light switch again. I'm just gonna plumb in a, a pressure switch in line with the brake line so we can eliminate that whole chunk over there and kind of streamline this a little bit, make it a little bit smaller and less, less chonky. This bracket here, uh, I also, there's a stud that goes in here. I shorten that stud up to get it a little further in so that there's not a huge gap in there anymore. And this, I'll probably just reuse this. I think we'll just put it on the bench and kind of round these corners off, clean it up and make it look a little, just a little nicer, but it's a, a totally functional piece. So we'll just reuse it. I don't want to eliminate all the old parts on this car. I mean, one of the reasons I bought this car is because it was like an old time hot rod, and I don't want to lose that look with it. Here's what we've come up with for, for a new bracket. I'm gonna cut this out of just some thin 16 gauge to make sure it's gonna fit before we cut it out of the quarter inch plate. Let's see how it fits. That should work okay. Bingo bango. Okay, that's that's a little bit better, I think. Let's bolt it on and see how it fits. I'm pretty happy with that. So let's clean this thing up and make it look a little more presentable. Just radius off the ends, maybe make that straight. There we have it, that, that looks a little better. I can live with that. Pro tip, when you're building brackets, 
always radius your corners. It does absolutely nothing to make the bracket a better bracket, but it makes it look nicer. This, uh, this fits great. I think we're going to snug these bolts up and then we'll move on to the clutch linkage here. Once the clutch linkage is done, I think we can blast this apart and give it a little touch up with, got some <clears throat> semi-gloss black spray paint. Yeah, those are snugged up. I guess, you know what? Before we build some clutch linkage, let's make sure this works. Oh yeah, that's great. Beautiful. Okay, clutch linkage time. So this current clutch linkage system that's in the car is literally just a flat piece of like eighth inch or 3 16 plate that goes from here to here. My first thought was just to, you know, do like we did with this piece, just remake this a little more streamlined, but then I realized like you can't adjust this. There's no adjustment at all in it. So does it need to be adjustable? I mean, in theory, yes. In the real world, my Roadster has been on the road for 13 years now, and I've never once adjusted the clutch linkage on that. The 47 Ford, I've been driving that for two years now. I've never adjusted the clutch linkage. That's just the way it was when I got it. So probably you don't need to, but I went rummaging through my bolt bin and I found some of these rod end heim joints and a little piece of threaded rod. So I think I might play around with these. Like, I don't even know if these are gonna fit in there, but I think we'll take this linkage apart and try this stuff and see if we can make it work. I mean, it would be cool if it was adjustable, even just so that like you can dial in where the pedals sit so they're they're even if nothing else but we'll uh do some experimenting all right here's what i've come up with so this plate right here kind of gives us our dimensions that we need to be the clutch pedal clevis in here is a quarter inch so I'm thinking I'll use some quarter inch plate. I took one of these rod ends and the threaded rod and I cut it down to just the length of the threads on here. I've got it threaded about halfway in right now. The distance from here to here is about the same as the distance from here to the end of the threads. So I think I'm going to, using this as a template, make a piece out of quarter inch that will go from here and weld to here. And that way we've got, you know, this distance again, but it's a little bit adjustable in here. And I think that should work. We'll try it and see. A little bit of trial and error. Here's kind of my plan. So this will be made out of quarter inch. We've got our, this end here. We'll go through the, the clutch pedal linkage and then this little notch right here will see if I can scale it here. Let's do some trick filming. Do, maybe not. <laughs> Anyways, that will sit like that. Or something like that. I don't know. You'll see. So this will sit just like that and we'll weld it up. I've already, I just kind of went and test fit this on the clutch pedal and I think we're gonna have to put just a little notch in there because when it's sitting in the pedal, it doesn't want to drop all the way down, but that's not a big deal.
I had to notch this piece a couple times, but actually just twice, second time I got it. I guess a couple times is twice, isn't it? But yeah, that's in there, that works great. I think now we can take this stuff all apart and paint it. Well, that went together really nice. I'm quite happy with this. I think our next step now is we're going to have to extend this master cylinder push rod because the master cylinder is moved further back than it was. The rod is not long enough anymore, but that's easy to do. So the first thing I did for these pedals is I just clamped a straight edge across the clutch pedal and that is holding the brake pedal in position and in line so that the, the pedal pads are both like parallel with each other. Then I went underneath the car and I put the push rod in, bottomed it out in the master cylinder and then took this tape measure and measured from this point right here to this point right here. And we are one inch. Instead of measuring center to center, because it's very hard to eyeball where the center is, I measure from one edge to the other edge. And that gives you the same measurement as center to center, but it's a little more precise. So we have to make this one inch longer. It should be pretty easy. I think we'll just cut and cut a piece at one inch and weld it on the end and then round the end like a little ball. So now that I know I need to make this an inch longer, I went and measured the overall length, which was six and a half inches, and then bumped this down to seven and a half inches. I've discovered that the thickness of this is the same as a 3 8 bolt. So what I'm gonna do is cut the end off where the threads are, kind of round this off a little bit like that, put them together, weld it, then put the whole deal in here, and then I can cut that off right at my seven and a half inch mark, and then round the end in the belt sander. So with that bolt welded on there, we're gonna set this in here now. Ooh, that is very warm still. Maybe we'll put it right there instead. And we'll put a little mark at the end, which should be seven and a half, which will be one inch longer. We'll cut that off and then round it off in the belt sander.
There we have it all rounded off. So we can go install it in the car. Hopefully, if I measured right. All right, it slides in there nice. And our bolt fits. Let's unclamp our vice grips up here. Hey Shannon, do you want to grab this? It's going to fall in a... Beautiful. Yeah. So I'm putting the bolt through now. It's, it's cool because it's like an early Ford bolt, which I like, but I am going to break the, the period correct rules and use a nylock nut on there because you know, brakes are kind of important. And if this bolt fell out, that loses, I lose all my brakes. So I don't want to lose my brakes. I know I could put a, like drill a hole and put a cotter pin through there as well, but I'm lazy. Okay, I don't want to try it because I don't have brake lines hooked up and I don't want any brake juice brake fluid that's in the master cylinder to squirt on my paint. So we'll do that later. Cool. Pedal assembly done. What have you been working on, Shannon? I have been cable lacing the spark plug wires together, trying to make them all neat and fancy and in order. I mean, we could have used the old zip tie trick, but that doesn't match the vibe for this car. So we took some inspiration from a couple cars and I trialed out a few different ways of doing it. And this is the way that I came up with. I think it looks great. Yeah. I'm so stoked. There'll be another one here. Cool. When we on. were at the Grand National Roadster show, there was a, oh, was it a, be yeah, a belly tanker that Corey Thelbert built. And I saw on Instagram just before all his wiring was done like that. And I think it's so cool. So we studied that one at the Roadster Show. And then we were talking to Cody Walls while we were there too. And he's the one that told us it's waxed linen cord is what you use to do this. Which we just got at. It's right here. We just got it at like the craft store at Michael's. It was like four bucks. Give us a how to. All right. So I take the, open the end of the cord and wrap it around the back. I come over on the left side and up over the, like that. I pull it nice and tight because this is the only way I can get the top layer tight after I start weaving it around. I have to poke up through each wire, pulling nice and tight as I go through the other side. This would be way easier if I had a needle with me, but I don't. So I'm just going to shove my fingers through the wires. Continuing to pull tight. Where'd you go? There you are. Okay, and then I just pull as tight as I can. And then I have not figured out a better way of finishing it other than just a square knot. So I just finish with a square knot at the end and then I cut the, the ends off and it ends up looking like that on the back. Marvelous. Well, it's Easter weekend. 
I was hoping to run brake lines today, but I forgot that it was Easter weekend. And yesterday when I went to order my residual pressure valves for the brake lines, they were all like, yeah, we can order them in. Won't have them for tomorrow though. We're not here tomorrow. It's a holiday. And I'm like, ah, so I'm not running brake lines this weekend, but there's other things we can do. Like put this uh, emergency brake in. So the emergency brake on this car is the one thing that did work great when I bought the car. Everything else was a total mess on the brake system, but I managed to drive this car from Make It Custom in Maple Ridge all the way to Victoria, which is like a three hour drive, using solely the emergency brake. However, now that we're putting the car back together, I realized the emergency brake's not quite right and this bolt on this heim joint right here is rubbing on the transmission case. One of those situations where when everything is so crappy, the, the good things, like you don't notice that they're actually not that great either. But we can fix this. We're just gonna warm this up a little bit and kind of just bend it over. And then it should clear okay. We'll test fit it, put it back together and hopefully our emergency brake system will be good to go again. Okay, let's give this a little bend. I think that should be enough. We'll let that cool off and then we'll test fit it. It's bolted in there now and it's, it's a little tight, but it does clear. So now we can focus on the other end, which is hooking it back up to this thing here. All right, I got the linkage hooked up. So here's no e-brake applied. Bam, that's on the second click. Let's go to the third. It's a little stiff. Oh yeah, that's working. Cool, e-brake's done. And what I mean by a little stiff is not the, the linkage isn't stiff, the uh, little teeth dealio, like when you pull it, it goes click, 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 and all the teeth, that part is a little bit stiff. I think it was a little bit seized up. So I've sprayed it with some penetrating oil and we'll just kind of let it do its thing and work in. It's getting better and better the more I use it. But yeah, I think the e-brake is done. Uh, I just used the same linkage that was already there. Moving along. One thing crossed off the list. One more thing crossed off the list, I should say. What are we gonna do now? Maybe eat some lunch. So the next thing we're gonna do is install this chrome oil filter. I don't know if you guys remember when we went to the Puyallup swap meet a while back, I got this oil filter there. Shannon had it mocked up on here the other day and it works good. So now we're going to plumb it in. So to plumb it in, we need to tap into this oil port back here, this oil gallery. We're just going to take this fitting out, thread this guy in there, and then that's going to allow us to run a quarter inch flare nut or tube nut in there. We've got some quarter inch line here and that is going to go up to this T fitting here, which also has the oil pressure gauge on it. Now this T fitting is kind of special or unique for these filters because it's a restrictor T fitting. That is, I believe a 60 thou, don't quote me on that, but a 60 thou oil restrictor and that way it kind of allows it to the engine to still maintain oil pressure. Otherwise, if this just plumbed right in there, all your oil pressure would, you, like you'd lose it because there'd be nothing to build pressure. So once it's in there, it's gonna go through a filter, which I don't have yet, come out this fitting down here. And then that is going to go into this port in the block and then drain back into the oil filter, or sorry, oil pan. So. Let's uh, get this going. 
Oil filter lines are all done. While I was doing that, Shannon went and put the acorn nuts all on for that uh, extra 35 horsepower. I'm gonna show you how I make these. This is just regular copper tubing. You can use whatever tubing you want. I really like to use copper nickel tubing, but I don't have any in quarter inch, so we'll just use straight copper. So the first thing I do is kind of get a rough measurement of where I wanna go. This one, for example, is 16 inches. We'll use this cutoff piece as an example. I cut that one a little bit too short. So once you get your, your rough measurement out of your coil, I have a tubing straightener that you can roll this through and it gives you a nice straight finish. So we'll cut our 16 inch, then you need your flaring tool. Now this is a very fancy flaring tool, but the principle still applies to a regular flaring tool. You got your two little dies here, and they look like this. You put it in the tool and clamp your end so that it is flush like that. You following still? Of course you are. You guys are on this. So you clamp that in there. You don't have to go super tight. Just squeeze it in there until it doesn't move anymore. Then you take your pointy guy like that. You slide that in there. This point goes in the end of the tube. So this is a hydraulic one. So I just squeeze it and you can see it's going up. On the manual ones, like you might have at home, you just have a big, you just turn it and it threads in. So you squeeze that or turn it until it bottoms out Then you back it off. And there you've got your, it should look something like that. From there, you take your cone, you slide your cone in and simply squeeze it again until it bottoms out. And boom, there's your flare. So now when we open this up, you've got your flared end, just like that. Don't forget to put your tube nut on before you flare it. And that's it. That's how I made those. Well, it's about two weeks later, which is why the cars are in a different position now. Uh, we're gonna use the skills that we just went over with making these lines and make some brake lines for this car now. So I've already started on the rear axle. I built these little aluminum tabs on the plasma table. Where'd the other ones go? There they are right there. Whoops, well, whatever, you get it. Built a couple of those and those are to hold the brake hose on. Why did I put my brake hose right there? Um, well, it's got lots of adequate room for suspension travel and there was already a hole there. So that's why I picked that particular spot. We've got our lines run along the axle to each wheel cylinder. They turned out really nice. Follows the, the little crown on the top of the rear end there. So now we need to go from the end of that hose over to the master cylinder. Probably gonna start at the master cylinder and work my way that way. So this is a 1967 Mustang master cylinder. 1967 was the first year for a dual reservoir master cylinder in North America. And these work really good 
on applications like this, because if you order one for a 67 Mustang with four wheel drum brakes, it's got the right bore diameter for a set of four wheel cylinders. On your master cylinder, this one's actually mounted backwards. If you were to have this on the Mustang, it would be bolted on the firewall facing the other way. So how do you know which goes to the front and which goes to the back? Well, when your push rod goes in, our push rod, if you remember, goes through here. The reservoir that it pushes on first always goes to the front. So this one here goes to the front brakes. This one here goes to the rear brakes. We're going to run a line coming out of this fitting. But before it goes to the hose, we need to run it through a residual pressure valve. Now these are, they're basically check valves. And what this is for is that master cylinder was originally designed to be on a firewall up here. It is now underneath the car and all our wheel cylinders are higher than the master cylinder, which is down here. So what these residual pressure valves do is they stop the brake fluid from like gravity is going to backfeed the brake fluid into the master cylinder and overfill it. These prevent that. They come in two different styles. For drum brakes, you need a red one, which is a 10 pound. And for disc brakes, they are blue and they are a two pound. So you want to mount these close to the master cylinder. They're directional. That side is out. This side is MC for master cylinder. I'm thinking we'll probably mount them right about there. That should be close enough to the master cylinder to be effective. So probably run this guy first, do a little line from where my finger is here over to here. Let's do that right now. Yeah, that worked out pretty nice. Just tightening it up now. Here's my uh, tech tip for the day when you're making flares, flared fittings. When you go to put it together, tighten it up, loosen it off, tighten it up, loosen it off. And do that a few times when you're tightening them up. And that way it, uh, it kind of lets the fitting, or like the flare kind of seat itself. It just means like less chance for leaks when you go to bleed it. All right, let's uh, probably there's a hole right here, so we can probably put a P-clip here just to secure this so it doesn't vibrate. And now we just got to make our line from here over to the frame rail, down the frame rail, and to that hose in the back. There we have it. The rear brakes are plumbed. So I've got a couple Adele clamps, also known as P-clips, holding it down in a couple spots. And I realize that some of these bolts might be used for the running boards. The ones I picked, I don't think are, but if they are, I mean, it's no big deal to unbolt this and either move this clamp somewhere else or just incorporate it into, like if we got a running board bolt coming through there, we'll just use the running board bolt to hold the clamp down. Not a huge deal. The line is nice and secure all the way. Although it looks like it's right up against the frame rail, it's actually not. There is a slight gap on both sides so that it won't vibrate through. 
Not that I don't know if it ever would. It's, uh, I didn't kind of plan it to do that. It just kind of worked out that way. So now we have to do the front, which is basically the same system. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot. I just want to show you the brake line that I'm using. I've talked about this brake line before on this channel, but this is copper nickel tubing. It is a alloy of copper and nickel, obviously, copper nickel tubing. It is DOT approved. It is, I think it came from Europe originally, and it is very resistant to like salty conditions, like high salt roads, which is what it was designed for. I like to use it on hot rods because it looks really cool. It kind of looks like copper brake lines, which I don't know about where you guys live, but where I live here in BC, copper brake line is illegal. So this way you can kind of get that vintage look, but it's still legal, which I like. And it, uh, it's really easy to work with. It's nice and soft. So before we run the front brake lines, I'm gonna take a pause because I'm actually in the middle of filming a video on brown sugar that kind of got postponed a bit because it was raining this morning. Which brings me to my next question. How do you guys feel about like, I got a lot of projects going on. I am all over the place, which is how I've been my whole life. And I know some channels are like, we're gonna build a 32 Ford and that's all that channel focuses on is start to finish of one car. Whereas my channel is, I'm working on a 32 Ford, working on a 47 Ford, working on Shannon's Comet, working on Brown Sugar. Plus I'm also, I do build videos on customer vehicles when they request it, such as like Andrew's 56 Chevy. Outside we've got uh, Steve Tilly's 59 Ford that the air conditioning parts just showed up for, so we're gonna get into that. But yeah, how do you guys feel about that? About like me working on like six or seven different projects all at the same time. Are you into that? Or would you rather I just focus on, we're building a 32 Ford right now. 32 Ford all the time now. So let me know what you guys think about that. Um, we'll get back to these front brake lines in a minute. Gotta finish brown sugar. Well, it's been a minute. It's actually been six days. Since the start of this video to today, it's we're at almost a month. It's been a, it's been a process. The shop is so busy right now. Plus we're, as you guys know, we're having a baby right away. So life's been super busy, but I've still been, still working on it. Just not as fast as I had hoped. I'm ready to do the front brakes. We just did the, the rear brakes. I say we just did it, but we did it last week. So we're doing the front brakes now, which is almost the same set up. We're gonna use the other residual pressure valve for the front, but we're also gonna add this guy in. And what this is, is a stoplight switch, a brake light switch. This is a hydraulic one. It plums in to the brake lines. It uses 3 16 inverted tube nuts, just like the brake lines use, and they go into this T. Coming out of the T, we have an adapter from a 3 16 to an eighth inch pipe thread. And that is what the hydraulic pressure switch is. It's eighth inch pipe thread, national pipe thread. I don't know what nationality it is, but that's not the point. The point is this thread's in here. You have a power wire, like a 12 volt hot wire that goes in here. When you step on your brakes and this pressures up, it completes a circuit in here, which sends power out of here to your brake lights to make your brake lights come on. Or in this case, it'll go to the signal light switch and that way the signal lights know how to, you know, do their whatever signal light switches do. I don't, I've never actually studied a signal light switch to know how they work, but, but it goes to the signal light switch and that way when you step on your brakes and turn your signal light on, the one brake light comes on and the other brake light still flashes. Magic, wizardry. So, we're probably gonna put this somewhere where it's accessible. This pressure valve, gonna try to plumb it so that it lands in about the same spot as that one. And we'll probably put this in a very similar spot. From there, we're gonna go to the front. I just finished mounting the front brake hoses. Let me show you how I did that. Remember those uh, little aluminum tabs that I was showing you earlier that I cut out on the plasma table? Well, those are mounted down in there and our brake hose goes to there. 
So I mounted those the same way that I did my Roadster when I built this car 13 years ago. And it also is on a stock frame with a cross member that was originally riveted in and is now bolted in. This one, if you'll remember, I instead of putting nuts and bolts or hot rivets, I used just a carriage bolt to give it the, the old timey look, but it's still accessible. So I took the rear bolt out and just put a regular nut and bolt in there with our brake hose tab. So from there, we'll, uh, we'll come out of the master cylinder to the pressure valve, to the pressure switch, come down the frame rail, go to a T-fitting that'll go to one wheel and then over to the other wheel. So everybody knows the story of when you make like the perfect flare and you forget to put the fitting on. Well, I got the fitting on, but I need this fitting, not that one. These are 316s, what I've been using for everything, but the front brake hoses, because they're early Ford ones, they were originally a quarter inch line going to them. So these are fittings that fit the quarter inch hole, but are for a 316 tube. And that guy is supposed to be there. Our brake lines are all plumbed now. I put the brake light switch right here. I kind of based it off of this 32 here, and that's a, a spot that's pretty easily accessible. Obviously, this one has a totally different configuration in mind, but it should be about right here. So it should be, you know, not a huge deal to change that if it ever needs to be changed. I think our next step now is we're going to pull this master cylinder back off, bench bleed it, carefully paint it, and then install it again, and then we can bleed the system. Master cylinder sitting in the bench vise here, and I've got these little lines run from the outlets back into the reservoir, which is full. And what we're going to do now is bench bleed it, which is where we get the air out of the master cylinder. This is an important step to do. If you don't do this, you'll end up with a spongy pedal. So all you do is you just need something blunt. I'm using the end of this quarter inch extension and you put it in where the push rod would go. And then slowly, slowly press the piston all the way down until you're no longer getting bubbles out of the master cylinder. So this master cylinder, because this was already in the car, this may have already been done. However, the brakes never ever worked in this car. So I don't wanna take any chances. I'd rather just spend the five minutes and do it. And then I know for sure it's done. Cause we are, we're not getting any bubbles out of the front reservoir, but we are getting bubbles out of the back. I just did this on Andrew Brittany's pickup behind me. So I apologize if there's like, I'm talking about stuff that I've already talked about. Doing the brake system on the truck and the 32 at the exact same time. And I don't know which video will be released first. Plus I know there's people that watch the 32 videos that won't watch the 56 pickup build and vice versa. So this way everybody gets it. Plus it's, I don't know, it's, sometimes it's good to hear things twice. Hey, I think we're, uh, I think we're pretty much good now. 
Yeah, I'm calling that good. So I'm gonna take these lines out and then carefully somehow paint this without getting brake fluid all over and contamination and you know, brake fluid and paint get along so good. Old time friends. This black paint will probably last all of three days because master cylinders, I don't know, paint and master cylinders just never works out. I've successfully painted the master cylinder and have it back on and filled without spilling anything or wrecking the paint. So before Shannon comes down and helps me bleed, I'm just going to give the system a couple good pumps here. And then we can kind of go and double check all our fittings to make sure that none of them are leaking. Make sure they're all nice and dry. That way when she does come down and helps me out, there's no like, nothing holding us back. Okay, those are all good so far. I think we're okay. That uh, hydraulic flaring kit I have is really, really good at making nice flares. Is that, oh, is that one? Yeah, we got one little dribble there. We'll give that a little snug up. Sometimes with flares, if you uh, loosen them off and tighten them up again, helps them seat. Okay. Yeah, I think we're okay. I guess nothing left to do now except bleed it. We've got brakes now. Oh man, nice and hard, firm brakes. Something that this car has never, ever had. Thanks to Shannon for helping bleed those. And Shannon has some exciting news for you guys. I do, look at, look at my new shirts. Shannon's got Comet shirts, her very own yeah. Comet shirt. With artwork done by our good pal, Martha McRuckus. Yeah. So those will be up on the website in men's and women's. So go check them out. Buy them. Buy them. <laughs> cool. Well, we got brakes now. I think that's a great spot to end this video. We got a lot done on this. I mean, this video has been a month in the making. So we've got our pedal assembly mounted. We've got our master cylinder mount done, our clutch linkage done. We've got all our plug wires run. Oil filter. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot. I got the oil filter in there. There's the part number for you, a Wix 51010. So the oil filter's in, oil filter's plumbed. Shannon made all these amazing plug wires that are all cable laced. You got your little Shannon tech tip. That tech tip right there is almost worth the price of a Comet shirt, don't you think? <laughs> ah, cool. Thanks to Hot Rod Hullabaloo for the music in this video. And thanks everybody for watching. I really appreciate it. The next video, we're probably going to just continue on with assembly. We still got the steering box to fit, front shock mounts, fuel tank. We're so close to putting the body back on, like on, not just mocking it up, but putting it on. So make sure to like and subscribe and hit notifications so that the next 32 video that comes up, you know all about it. We'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching. <laughs>